Okay, so let's get started today. Uh, we are going to be continuing our discussion of uh, binary search trees today and hopefully get through it. Just a quick uh, note about Lab 10. You'll notice if you've either read the lab description yet or if you read the lab description before coming to lab tomorrow, you'll note that a couple of the procedures you're supposed to write in lab 10 deal with AVL trees. We will get to AVL trees on Thursday, and you will have plenty to finish in the lab tomorrow without having to worry about the two functions that are related to AVL trees. So never fear, we will get to AVL trees by Thursday, hence by Thursday you will be able to complete all parts of the lab. So just heads up on that. So on, two, on Thursday we covered an introduction to trees and today we're going to specifically start looking at binary search trees which are a very handy uh, type of tree for finding, inserting, and deleting elements and as a fourth element, so let me put that down, so binary search trees We're going to find that they have the following useful operations. They are useful for insert an element, for finding an element, for deleting an element, and this is where they differ from hash tables for maintaining elements in sorted order. And this makes them good for another type of query called a range query. So for example, let's say I was keeping track of a race database for results from races. I used to be a runner, so something of near and dear to my heart. So let's say I wanted to find all runners who completed a race between the times of 15 minutes in 17 minutes. That's not a good query for a hash table to answer because I would have to start by first querying for all runners with a time of 15 minutes, then all runners with a time of 15 minutes and one second, then 15 minutes and two seconds, all the way up to 17. Be much better if I had a data structure where I could simply find and the first element at 15 minutes and then do some kind of traversal until I reached the runner at 17 minutes. Also, it would be nice, let's say that the first runner actually is at 1503 rather than 15. So the first runner after 15 minutes turns out to be at 1503. Binary search trees have a way of handling that. We're not actually going to probably get to it in class, but there's a good chance I'll get to it on an exam problem because uh, that's a nice additional, that's a huge hint to you too. Um, it's a useful, what right up to this point, we've only focused on operations that return true or false. Did we find the value or did we not find the value? But if we want to answer a range query like this, we would like to have find return a pointer to the first element that is greater than or equal to 15. So if we do a find on 15, we really don't want false to come back. Instead, what we really want 
is a pointer to the first node greater than or equal to 15 to come back. And then, of course, we can check to see whether it's equal to, if it's a what we call a point query. So this is a, a range query is asking to find values from between two values. What we're been looking at up to now are what are called point queries, which look for a specific value. Okay, so we may want to, for example, on the final exam, modify find so that instead of returning true false, it returns a pointer to the first node that is greater than or equal to the key. So this is something that binary search trees can do that hash tables cannot. There is a price to be paid. If you remember, hash tables are able to perform insert, find, and delete in what, in average, what time? If I write big O, what is the average time for a hash table for any three, for any of those three operations? Constant, which we write as order one. We're not going to do that well with trees. With trees, what we're going to find is that we can perform these operations, each of them in order, log, end time. On average. Okay, it's going to turn out that in the worst case, it's going to be order n, just like for hash tables. But on average, it's going to be log n. And as I explained a couple weeks ago, binary search trees are often used to implement maps and sets or some variation of a binary search tree. And they're going to work, they're going to get their login performance by mimicking binary search. Remember, binary search works on an array, a sorted array, and at each step it eliminates half of the remaining array. And because it eliminates half the remaining array, it gets its log n performance. That's going to be the strategy for binary search trees as well. At each step, they're going to attempt to delete half of the remaining entries. The advantage they have over binary search is that they can accommodate insertions and deletions. Binary search did not readily accommodate insertions and deletions because it was being done on an array. And doing inserts and deletes from the middle of arrays is inefficient. So this is why trees were invented. OK, so what are binary search trees? They are trees where each node has a value, a left child, and a right child. Now, it's not required to have a left child or a right child, but at most, each node has two children. Okay, so at most, each or each node has at most two children. Hence the word binary. Okay, it has a couple of additional important properties. So if a node has a left child, then the left child is the root 
itself of a binary search tree and its maximum value of any value in that left subtree is less than or equal to the node's value. So if basically a binary search tree, I have two, here's my node, it has a key, and rule, this rule right here, I'll say rule one, says that everything in the left subtree is less than key, and everything in the right subtree is greater than key. This is assuming that we have no duplicates. If we have duplicates, things get a little more complicated, and you just arbitrarily, in that case, would say that either the left or the right subtree is <coughs> in this case we'll say less than equal, so if I'm going to allow duplicates then I would arbitrarily pick either the left or the right subtree to hold the duplicates. In this case I choose the left subtree. So that's rule one. Rule two is well, actually rules one and rule two, so basically this is rule one and this is rule two. Okay, so all keys in the left subtree are less than the key at the root, all keys in the right tree greater than the keys at the root. Okay, how does this help us? Well, let's first look, before we say how does this help us, let's just look at a few example binary search trees. Okay, so here's a number of them. The tree on the left with the single node Fred is a binary search tree. Okay, it's a single node, but that's fine. The second one, Fred has two children, Binky and Luther. You'll notice Binky is less than Fred and Luther is greater than Fred, so it obeys rules one and two. This third one is also a binary search tree, even though it's only got a right child, that's fine. There's no requirement that a uh, node have a left child and everything in the right subtree is greater than Binky and that's also recursively true so everything in Fred's right subtree is greater than Fred. Okay, And finally this is the most interesting one, the fourth one Okay, a little bushier, but everything in the right subtree is greater than Binky. And recursively, that's also the case. Everything in Fred's left subtree is less than Fred. Everything in Fred's right subtree greater than Fred. Okay, yes? Is Fred's left subtree uh, greater, uh, less than Binky and greater than Binky? Is greater than Binky. So... so Yes, so if we look at Fred's left subtree, we know for a fact that it all keys in it are less than Fred, but greater than Binky. Okay, the reason we know that is everything in Binky's right subtree has to be greater than Binky. So that takes care of this inequality. Okay? And then everything in Fred's left subtree must be less than Fred, taking care of that second inequality. So yes, we could not, if for example, let's say that we had coming off of Daisy, let's say we had Alfred. This is not a valid binary search tree because Alfred is in the right, if we look at the right subtree for Binky, we see it contains Alfred, and Alfred is less than Binky, making it an invalid binary search tree. Okay, so in order for this one to be valid, 
Alfred would have to be over here. Can you go over that one more time? Yes. Okay. So if somehow, so if I gave you on an exam for an exa example, if I gave you a tree that looked like this, and I asked, is this a b valid binary search tree? You should say no. And of course, I would ask you for why is it not? And you would say, because Alfred is in Binky's right subtree. So if we look at Binky's right subtree, there it is. Okay, Alfred is part of that right subtree. But this rule here says that if a node has a right child, then the right child is the root of a binary search tree whose minimum value is greater than or equal to the node's value. But here, Alfred has a minimum value that's less than Binky. So it violates that second the, the, uh, statement I have highlighted in blue. Okay. Yes? How do we know it's less than Binky? Because Alfred, in alphabetical order, A is less than uh, B. Yep, this is all alphabetical order. Yep. OK. So this is certainly a type of question I could give you on an exam. Probably too easy. But does everyone understand that? OK. In fact, I think that the next couple examples show you some more non-binary search trees. So here, this one, even though every, so in both cases, in this case, this is still a binary tree because there's a difference between a binary tree and a binary search tree. Okay, a binary tree, every node has at most two children. In a binary search tree, there's the additional, these two additional stipulations. Okay, so down here, the first example is a binary tree. It is not a binary search tree because Daisy, Luigi, and Luther are all greater than Binky. They need to be in the right subtree. And then the left one is not even a binary tree. So even though in the right one they kind of obey in some sense our search criteria that the children, if you look at the children, in some sense they seem, all the ones with left-facing ones look like they're less than Fred and all the ones with right-facing or right-leaning links look greater than Fred. It's not a binary tree, so it doesn't qualify as a binary search tree. Okay? So, Binary search trees, though, have a wonderful property, which is if I'm trying to find a value, then I can do the following algorithm. Let's say I'm trying to find Luther in this tree. Okay, and I can't actually easily hide it. Well, I can kind of, just a moment. So we'll go down here. So all you see is Binky. Okay, and we're trying to find Luther. Which subtree do you know Luther must be in? The right subtree. So at this point, we can eliminate all the nodes that are in the left subtree. Okay, so we go now to Fred. And which subtree must Luther be in? The right subtree, because Luther is greater than Fred. And voila, there's Luther. So we can return true, or we can return the value that's associated with Luther, whatever we wish to do with our find operation. So the reason we're able to kind of get this login performance is that, in general, if roughly half of our nodes are in the left subtree, 
and roughly, so if we have n, n nodes in the tree total, and roughly n divided by 2 are in the left subtree, and n divided by 2 are in the right subtree, then our comparison is going to eliminate one of the two, leaving us with only half the nodes to be compared. Okay? And if this one is similarly well balanced, okay, so that roughly half and half, then you can see that once again, when we eliminate one of the two subtrees, we've again halved our search space. And when we can halve our search space at each step, that leads to a log n algorithm. Okay, so this is a very nice, very elegant, simple uh, program. And it actually can be written recursively if we want it, but we won't show you that just yet. Okay, so I told you that binary search trees support find, insert, and delete. Okay, I think find we've already pretty much covered, right? Pretty simple. How do you think insert would get done? Let's say that I want to insert um, uh, let's see Glenda. I know I can't think of a very good G name. Okay, if I was going to insert Glenda where do you think it should get inserted? Pardon? So we compare it with Binky, and does it go to the left or to the right of Binky? Pardon? To the right. Okay, so it has to go into the right subtree. So we come down to Fred. So it has to be, it's greater than Fred, right? So it's going to have to be in Luther's subtree. Okay, now should Glenda be in Luther's left subtree or Luther's right subtree? You want it to be above it, but we can't have it. There's no room for it above it. That's, so in the, what we're trying to do is find a space for Glenda in the search tree. So okay. you can't like insert your unexisting? No, because there's no space for it. If you look... Fred, you, you might say, well, I'd like to somehow insert um, Glenda between Fred and Luther, but there's no space there. Fred, both of Fred's entries are occupied. Okay, Sarah. So now we go left down to Lugi, because Glenda needs to be in Luther's left subtree. Okay, so we're still okay. And finally, when we get down to Lugi, we see that Lu Glenda should be in which subtree for Lugi? Or Lugi? It's Luigi. 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 <laughs> Never claimed I was good with names. Luigi. Now I know why everyone is snickering. Okay. So how do we pronounce the one on the right? Waluigi? Waluigi. Okay. Well, we probably won't be inserting anything into that subtree. <laughs> That's why we didn't insert Vandersand. Okay, so we get to Luigi, and we find that Glenda should be in Luigi's left subtree. Even better, we find that Luigi doesn't have a left child. Therefore, we can actually, we have found a place in the tree for Glenda. We can put Glenda after Luigi. Okay, and so we can create a new node and put Glenda right here. And this still satisfies the binary search tree, because if we look at this new search tree, okay, Glenda is in the right search tree for Binky. That's correct, because Glenda is greater than Binky. Now it's in... She's also in Fred's right subtree because Glenda is greater than Fred. And 
Glenda is in Luther's left subtree because Glenda is less than Luther. And finally, Glenda is in Luigi's left subtree because Glenda is less than Luigi. So we have reestablished or maintained our binary search tree property, and we've successfully inserted Glenda. Okay? As an exercise, why don't you, just uh, for a moment, take a moment and try to insert, let's see, Alfred, Aardvark. We'll get rid of Glenda for a moment. <clears throat> Whoops. So we're going to insert Alfred, Aardvark, and let's see, how about um, Ellen into this tray. I'll assume it's all capital, so don't ignore capitalizations. It's alphabetical order. So we're inserting Alfred, Aardvark, and Ellen in that order. So order is important. Okay, we'll show you that in a moment. So take a moment, do that. Now this is an exercise that I almost certainly will give you on the final. A series of keys, and I'll tell you to insert them. Okay, it looks like most of you are done. So, let's see. Go around the room. Hardalyn, where would we put Alfred? I think he's left subtree, right. So, Alfred <coughs> is going to be put right here because Alfred is a left child of Binky, or is less than Binky therefore become, and Binky has no left child, therefore Alfred becomes the left child of Binky. So we've inserted Alfred. Next we've got the binary search screen. We're going to insert Aardvark. So gentleman right there, what's your name? Me? Yep. Uh, Paul. Paul. Um, We're just left, of left of Alfred. Very good. So Aardvark is less than Binky, so we go down to Alfred. Then Aardvark is less than Alfred, and since 
Alfred does not have a left child, we end up putting our dark there. Okay, finally Camille. Where does Ellen go? Right child of Daisy, very good. So, whoops. So Ellen goes right here because Ellen is greater than Binky, hence in the right subtree. Ellen is less than Fred, so down to there. Ellen is greater than Daisy, so Ellen goes into Daisy's right subtree. And since Daisy has no right child, we put Ellen there. Now, remember I said that order is important. You can get different binary search trees based on a different order of insertion. So let's say, let's take away Ellen for a moment. Here's the search tree I had when I inserted in the order Alfred and Aardvark. But let's say that I instead first inserted Aardvark and then I inserted Alfred, so I switched the order. In that case, what's going to happen is Aardvark is going to be the left child of Binky, and where is Alfred going to end up? The right child of Aardvark. So in binary search trees, the order of insertion is important and you will get different binary search trees based on different orders of insertion. So they're not, in some sense, the operations are not commutative. You come up with different search trees based on different orders of insertion. Okay, so we good with that? Okay, let's look at some code mix things up a little bit. So let's see how find and insert actually get implemented. Okay, so we come down here. We see that the way Dr. Planck set things up, he created, first of all, what we call a container class. So this is, VS tree is what we call the container class, just like when we had a list, we had a list container class, so it's going to be the container, and then inside of it, we're going to have BST nodes. Okay, so each of these is going to be a binary search tree node. So the container object is the BS tree, and then we have inside of it the node objects. And you can see that each node has a left and right for pointers to its left and right children or left and right subtrees. We're also going to keep a pointer to the parent so that we're, it's going to be required for insertions and for deletions. So we always are going to keep a pointer back to our parent. Then we're going to keep the key which determines where the item is inserted and a value. And you have not yet seen voids. Okay? Actually you have when you were in 102 and in when you were returning nothing from a procedure you make it a void procedure. What you haven't seen is a void star, a pointer to a void. So a void star is, think of it as a generic pointer. It can point to anything. So a void star can be an int star. It could be a string star. It could be a float star. It could be a employee pointer. It can be anything. So a void star, think of a void star as a generic pointer. It can point to anything. 
So that's what we're doing is we're saying val is a pointer that can point to any type of object. Okay, that's very nice. It's a C idiom that allows us to store multiple types of values because typically we're limited to a single value. If we declare something as an int, it can only store integers. If we uh, declare it as a string, we can only store strings. And that's kind of limiting. Just like here, the key has to be a string. That's kind of limiting. The way C++ fixes this problem is with templates. Okay, so when you actually declared a map, you would declare it, say, as string, comma, maybe int. And that would allow you, that would say that the key was a string and that the value was an int. But we don't want to get into the complexities of declaring templates right here. It turns out the syntax for declaring templates is rather convoluted. You'll learn about it in CS365 if you go on to that course. And Dr. Plank did not want to deal with it here. Therefore, instead of using templates, he used a void star for the val. It's an old C trick. Yes, Mark? Can you mix types with void star? Yes, that's what you're doing here in some sense. You could, now, it wouldn't be a good idea to have your binary search tree having the values be multiple types, but you could do it. You could mix types here. Not safe. Okay, because... But you can't do that with templates, though, can you? No, you can't do that with templates. Templates enforce a stronger type checking on it. Okay? This is dangerous because you have to know what type of value you're putting in here. In order to unpack it, so to speak, you're going to have to do a down, what's called a downcast. So when you get, if you have a BST node, N, and you know that the value is an int, then you can say int, say, V equals int star N val. And what you're doing is you're now, this is called a downcast because you're casting it down from a generic pointer, which is a void star, to a specific type of pointer, which is an int star. Now, if for some reason that val isn't a pointer to an int, but is a pointer to a string, you're probably headed for a seg fault. You, a, if, I, if I use templates, that could not happen. It would force me to store ints as the value. So this gives me rope to hang myself, okay? But it is flexible. But this is how I would then, once I wanted to, if I knew I was storing integers as values, I would remove a value by first downcasting it to the appropriate type. Okay, so if we now look at our, any questions about that before I continue? Alan? In C, this is the accepted way to do these sort of things. Yes, that's right. In C, this is the accepted way of doing these kinds of things. So that's why I called it a C idiom. And you will find out that Dr. Plank grew up in the C world, actually so did I, so we're kind of old school that way. Other comments or questions? Okay. So moving on then, and looking at our methods, we have our constructor and destructor. The constructor, simply to initialize the container. The destructor will need to destroy all the nodes that we create. We'll see that. Then the insert operation that inserts a key into the tree and tells us whether the insert succeeded. That's the return value. The void, which is going to find 
a key and return a pointer to the value of that key. Delete, which will delete a key from the tree and tell us as a return value whether the key was actually in the tree or not. So it will allow us to try to delete a key that's not there. And if the key was not there, it would simply return false. Void gives us a pretty way to print the tree so that we can view its contents. Size, the number of elements in the tree. Empty, true or false, depending on whether the tree is empty or not. And a vector so that if we want, we can get a, sorry, keeps coming back. Well, having trouble highlighting it. There we go. A sorted vector, which is the function, is going to return a vector of values, and it will be by sorted key. So what sorted vector does is it traverses the tree by alphabetical order of key and puts the values into that vector based on alphabetical order. So that's our public API. Then you'll see that we have some instance variables or member variables. So we have a Sentinel node. We're going to use a Sentinel node just like we did with our lists. We're going to keep the size as an integer and that vector void star array is going to be our storage that we use for creating a vector that we will return to the user by sorted vector. Then you notice we have three protected methods. These are methods that are called helper methods. We do not want them to be visible to the programmer. They have no business using these methods. So we make them protected. But they will be used to help us implement several of our methods. Probably have a good idea by looking at their names what they will be used to help with. So recursive in order print probably will help with our print method. Recursive make array, what do you think that will be helping out with? Sorted vector. Sort it vector. And recursive destroy? Destructor. The destructor. Okay, so in general we only make public those methods that we wish a programmer to be able to use. That's called the public set of methods is called the API for Application Programmer Interface. I know I've said it before, but it's important enough to repeat. It's the Application Programmer Interface. We do not want to include in that interface methods that we strictly use to help. Okay? So, before I get into it, I'm just going to go back because you can see we're using a Sentinel node. So what the Sentinel node is going to do is it's just going to be the first node in the tree. It's always going to exist even when we have an empty tree. It's right child actually points to the root of the tree. So the sentinel node is not the root. The sentinel node is not the root, okay? It's right child points to the root. And the reason we have a sentinel node is to avoid the tricky special case of when we ha are inserting into a empty tree or deleting the last node from a tree. We don't want to have to consider the special case of what happens if the tree is empty when we're inserting or becomes empty when we're deleting. 
If we have a sentinel node, we always guarantee there's at least one node in the tree, and therefore our insert operation is always allowed to assume there's at least one node in the tree. And similarly, the delete knows it's never actually wiping out all of the nodes in the tree. Okay, so let's take a look at these methods. Okay, Dr. Plank is going is assuming that his value is going to point to person objects. So he's assuming that his values consist of a name, a phone number, and a social security number. So he wrote a uh, driver program that you could use to test his code. So for example, insert Binky, whose phone number is 94, now uh, let's see, is that, I'm going to assume that that is Binky's phone number. So we're going to assume that the first field is the phone number and the second field, ah yes of course, is the phone number and the second field is the social security number. So he just has a number of commands then that you can do. So print is going to print out, do a in-order traversal of the tree, and it's going to print it out in a way that if you were to rotate the output, 90 degrees clockwise. So if you took this output and you rotate it, it's going to look like a tree. Okay, so it takes some time to get used to reading it. It would be nice, obviously, if we could output a tree that looks like this, but that's not easy to do with ASCII art. It's devil, devilishly difficult, in fact. So he has to do it kind of in this linear way, one object or one key per line. And he's simply indenting to give you an idea. So the root is not indented at all. The right subtree is indented two spaces. And then Fred's right and left subtrees are indented two spaces. So the right subtree actually gets printed first, and the left subtree second. So this right here, it's getting a little cluttered. This is actually Binky's right subtree. And there is no left subtree, but it would be after Binky. So in fact, we're going to be doing what's called a reverse in order traversal because we'll be visiting the right subtree, then the key, and then the left subtree. So any questions about that? We good? Okay. So just some other examples of things. You can look at it on your own. But then the implementation, let's say that we insert Fred, Binky, and Lu Luigi. Okay, so our tree conceptually looks like this. Fred, Binky, and Luigi, if we do the inserts in that order. Okay. So if we look at, and then we have a sentinel node actually up here. So that's going to conceptually be what we have. So if we go down here and have a look, okay, we see this is our container object right here in blue. So this is our container object. Okay, so that's a BS tree. Then the yellow nodes are BST nodes. So everything in yellow is a BST node. 
and everything in green is a person. Make sure that's what he called it. Yep, called it a person. So all the green nodes are persons. Okay, so this one right here is the Sentinel node. And you can see that, as we said, it's right child is Fred. Okay, here's the key for Fred. Okay, Fred's value points to a person record. So that has Fred's information. You can see, if we go just back slightly, that Fred's parent is the Sentinel node. And then you can see its left goes down to Binky and its right goes down to Luigi. Okay, going to get rid of that. If we look at Binky, we see that Binky's parent is Fred. We see that its left and right both go to the Sentinel node. So the if a node does not have a child or doesn't have a left child, then it will point to a Sentinel node. Same thing if it doesn't have a right child, it will point back to the Sentinel node. This will allow us to know when we've gotten to the bottom of a tree. Is if we find that a child is equal to the Sentinel node, we know we've reached the bottom of the tree. And then Binky's value, a pointer to a person record. Okay? So questions about this diagram? Does that kind of show you the outlines of what's going on with the different fields? Okay? So moving on, when we create the tree with the constructor, we create a Sentinel node. We set its parent to null because the Sentinel node is the one node in the tree that has no parent. We set its left to null and we set its right to the Sentinel node. Why do we set its right to the Sentinel node? Well, right points to the root. Currently, there is no root. It's an empty tree, and we said that if something doesn't have a child, it points to the sentinel node. So we make, since it's an empty tree, we make the right child point to the sentinel, and we set the size to zero. Okay, and then size and empty functions, pretty easy. Okay. Nothing big there, so let's take a look at the find function. Remember, the find function is simply going left or right depending on what we see, but there's a few things, nuances. So first of all, when we start, we have to go to the root of the tree, so that's what that, this right here is uh, set n to the root. So remember, sometimes you all ask, when is it right to write a comment? This is a good place, actually, for a comment, because it's not obvious to someone reading the code that this is what's going on here. So that, you don't say set n to sentinels right. That's obvious. What you do is you say, what is the effect of the action? And it is to set n to be the root of the tree or to set n to point to the root of the tree. So while one, so while it's true, he's putting it into an infinite loop, he's saying if n is equal to the sentinel, it means we failed. We got down to the bottom of the tree, and we never found it. Okay? That can happen. May, the key may not be in the tree. Eventually, we will exhaust nodes to look at. So if we get to the sentinel, we didn't find the key, we return null. Second case, 
If we find the key, then we return its value. Okay? Otherwise, we either go to the left or right subtree depending on the comparison, the outcome of the <coughs> comparison. So if our search key is less than the key at the current node, we go to the left subtree. And if it's greater than the current node, we go to the right subtree. So a pretty simple algorithm. Okay? Any questions about that? I do want to show you a couple things, a couple tricks. Well, first of all, there is a recursive solution as well. Okay, so I could have written this in a recursive fashion. Now, I'm, this is a situation where speed is essential, and therefore I'm using a loop because I want it to be as fast as possible. But I could have written this function recursively. Okay, so what I could have done is I could have had void vst tree find string s. And the first thing I simply would have done is I would have written a recursive function. I would have said return. Recursive find. Hmm. I'm going to have to write more. Okay, I'm going to go to notebook because I don't have enough. Actually, what I'm going to do is go and use an editor. So I could have said void star bs tree find string s. And what I could have done is simply made a recursive call. So I have to write a recursive find function, passing s and the sentinel. Okay. Then my recursive function, I would have had to declare it as a protected function. And it's going to take a BST node. Okay, so I would say if n is equal to the sentinel, then I failed, so I return null. Okay, otherwise, else if n key is equal to s, I would return n val, else if s is less than n key, I would return recursive find s and left, else I would return recursive find s and right. Okay, so that's a recursive version of the find function. Okay, if I Let's see if I can lay it side by side. Okay, there it is, side by side with the recursive version. So you see what I do is, with the recursive find, this is, oh shoot, comparable to the statement over here where I pass in the root. Then in my recursion, just as over here, if n equals sentinel, I return null. Else if the s is equal to the key, I return nval, same thing. 
The only difference is if s is less than the key, I now do a recursive find on the left child. Okay? So recursion, it has a beautiful, actually, recursive solution. It's just not as fast because of all the recursive calls. And that's why Dr. Plank and in the STEL library, it's written non-recursively. But you can write it recursively. Okay. Here is another cute thing that you can do with Sentinel nodes. Okay. I could set the Sentinel node key equals S and Sentinel val equal null. Then I don't even have to check to see if n is equal to the Sentinel node. Okay, can someone tell me why this code will now work? Why don't I have to check for the Sentinel node anymore if I add this code up here? Well, let's take a look. Let's say that I have Fred, here's my Sentinel node, Binky, and I forget what the other one was, Luigi. Okay, remember that these things, the left and rights, point up to the Sentinel node. Okay? Well, what did I set the Sentinel? Let's say I was searching for Glenda. Okay, so what I did right here is I set the key to be Glenda in the Sentinel node. Okay, I said if n key equals s. So I start by my search right here. So s is Glenda. I first check whether Glenda is equal to Fred. It's not. So I go to here. Glenda is not less than Fred, so I return a recursive find using Luigi. Luigi. Then I check to see whether the key is equal to S. Glenda is not equal to Luigi. So I check to see if S is less than the key. Well, Glenda is less than Luigi, so I'm going to follow the left child. What is the left child? Well, the left child is the sentinel. So now when I come in, this condition succeeds. Because I've reached the Sentinel node, Glenda is equal to the value I stored in the Sentinel, and I return nVal, which I so conveniently set to be null. Okay, this is a very common trick performed with Sentinel nodes. I'm not going to test you on it, but you should get used to seeing this trick because it can really simplify a lot of code. Okay, here it may seem to you that it makes it a little more complicated. I won't argue with you on that. But oftentimes, being able to take advantage of the fact that the Sentinel node does not store a value or a key allows you to play with it in this way to simplify the code and avoid special cases. Yes, Alan? Yes, thank you. You are absolutely right. Yes. This is what happens when I write code and don't run it. Okay. So it should be this. So yes, I first, if I did do that, I would actually end up in an infinite recursion because it would never set the key until afterwards. So first need to set the key to S then set the vowel to null, then make my recursive call, and I need to return it. Thank you, Alan. Yes, Doug? Why do you need to return the recursive call as opposed to just call one? Okay, because if I just did the recursive call, 
like this, that's not, there's no return statement, therefore the, I'm not doing anything with the return value. It's just nothing happens in this case. If I tried to, I, I'm not going to be able to compile it because I don't have the other code handy, but if I tried to, I'd get an error message saying that there's no return statement for the find function. Okay, let's see if I can do that quickly. Actually, I think I can. Let me... I'm going to change his implementation. So one of his recursive and none of his recursive functions are returning anything. Okay. Uh, Unfortunately, I can't quickly do it, but let's say, let's do something similar, actually. Let's go to the size, okay? Actually, let's go to empty. You could say, okay, why do I have to put a return statement there? Why can't I just say that? Size equal equals zero. That's what you're saying with why do I have to write return recursive find? Why can't, you're in effect saying, why can't I just write that? Okay, that's what, same thing. So if I were to try to compile this, just a second. What? That's impossible. It's just a warning You're probably right, but that's just bizarre. Mm-hmm. There we go. No return statement in function returning non-void. On my Mac, this would give me an error message. Okay. So before I forget... Okay, other questions about, about this? Mark. So for returning, because it's void star, you have to return? Because normally when you have Yes, very excellent point. So Mark's question is, normally if it's a void, I don't return anything. But when it's a void star, that's different. Now what I'm saying is that I'm returning a generic pointer. Therefore, it fully expects a return statement. Okay, so that's excellent question. Void by itself means no returns. Uh, value, but void star means you have to return a generic pointer. Okay, other questions? Okay. No, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to move on to the insert. So the insert, a little more complicated. Okay, again, what we're going to be doing is as we go down, so let's say this is kind of our tree, and let's say this is the path we're going to follow. What he's going to be doing is n is always going to be a pointer to the current node, and he's going to keep a trailing pointer to the parent. Okay, so parent is a trailing pointer. It's always saving the previous node we visited. The reason is eventually we're going to get down. Let's say that we want to do our insertion right here. Eventually what's going to happen is, what is n eventually going to point to when we're done, do you think? When would we stop searching? When do we know that we have an available spot? 
percent no no so when we eventually get to the point where n actually is pointing to the sentinel node, we know that we've reached an empty spot in the tree, right? We want to keep going until we find a empty spot. So if this node right here doesn't have any children, it really does. It has a pointer to the sentinel node. The problem is, with n pointing to the sentinel node, we'd have no idea where to insert it. We lost the information about where to insert it. That's where the trailing parent pointer comes in. If we keep a trailing parent pointer, we haven't lost the information about where we should do the insertion. So that's the intent of keeping this trailing parent pointer. Okay, so this is just the search part. So if we find the key, so if the key is already there, we return zero to indicate a failure. We don't insert a, we're assuming our tree cannot hold duplicates. Otherwise, we set the parent to n because the parent is a trailing pointer, and now we advance n to either the left or right subtree. Okay? Eventually, n, we reach the end of the tree, and n points to a sentinel node, or to the sentinel node. So we stop when n points to the sentinel node. Okay, the whole point of this loop is to make the loop find the parent to which the new node will be attached. So this loop finds the parent to which the new node is made a child. Okay, so when we have found the parent, that's just setting up the new node, set the new node, set the key and the value, these two, the new nodes, left and right, it's a leaf node. Therefore, we make its left and right point to the sent node. And the new node's parent is whatever the parent is. Right? So if we were, um, had, say, again, uh, Fred, Binky, and Luigi, and we're inserting Glenda, and parent points to Luigi, well, we can see that Glenda's parent should be equal to parent, should be equal to Luigi. So that's what this statement right here is taking care of. Okay, then we need to figure out how to do where to put it. Is it a left child or a right child? Well, there's three cases. First case is the tree was empty. The tree was empty, the new node becomes the root, in which case it is case number one, which is we set the sentinel right to end. So this is saying if the tree is empty. So if the tree is empty, we make the sentinel's right point to the node. Else, we know that it's not, so we check to see if S is less than the parent's key. If S is less than, less than the parent's key, which it is here, Glenda is less than Luigi, then we make the parent's left equal N, and else we make the parent's right equal N. Okay, so that hooks it all in. Anything else we have to do? These are things you would not want to forget if you were implementing it. Need to increment the size. Forget to increment the size and there's issues such as your empty function returning the wrong result. So you need to remember to increment size.
Okay. I will tell you right now that for your lab tomorrow, eventually you're going to be doing some stuff with AVL trees. And you will be changing the structure of the tree. If you forget about the parent pointers, you will be in a world of hurt. Okay, this was the first time all semester that it took me more than a few minutes to write the lab, and it was because I, when I did some adjustments, I only adjusted two of the three parent pointers. And it took me about half an hour to find the problem. So I'm just warning you right now, make sure in this lab when you are doing the rotate function that you modify all appropriate parent pointers. There will be three parent pointers that you will need to adjust. Will need to be adjusted in rotate method of lab 10. It is worth writing this down because otherwise you may spend, it took me half an hour, okay? Good chance that you will end up having a TA debug it for you if you don't make the adjustments properly. It is incredibly difficult to debug, okay? So we will cover delete on Thursday. You do not know how, you do not need to know how delete is implemented in order to do tomorrow's lab. So we will cover delete on Thursday, and we will also cover AVL trees starting on Thursday. And I will see you on Thursday.